they're believing that he he is who he claims to be but he really cl makes that claim in progressive stages um, and we're just past the point where he has openly said I am the Son of God I am the Messiah he is just he's about six months from crucifixion here and he has just now come to the place where he is openly saying I'm going to go to Jerusalem and I'm going to die on the cross so at this point they are believing that he is the Son of God they're going to have to come to the place where they believe that he is the Messiah and as the Messiah that his uh, responsibility his orders from heaven are to die as the Messiah and so you've got a lot going on here in the Gospels you've got a progression to come to the place where John will in the end say uh, that you have to believe these things to be true for you and so in this passage we have the word believe used but used different times all the way through now this is the connecting thing all the way through the critical thing was you must believe but here is this group of people and 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 in verse 30 as he spake uh, many believed on him but always remember that's not the same exact thing as when we say he's a believer uh, they believe that he was uh, the son of God they may have been coming to the place of belief that he was the Messiah but he's asking them to take another step here and that's what Joe w wisely pointed out today is that he's asking them to make the step from simply believing that he can do great miracles and simply believing that he is a great man and and the son of God to asking them to believe that he is God and this is where they couldn't make that jump they really were angered by that to the point where they picked up stones we cannot accept that message we're not willing to go that far with what you're teaching us so at the very beginning for this mature uh, intellectual crowd tonight there is an issue there as we come to that where we're we are legitimately looking at people who have made a profession but they haven't made it all the way to a profession that brings them to biblical salvation and so what we looked at this morning is a very legitimate thing where we say that Jesus Christ is looking at these people and he says I have a legitimate question about the legitimacy of your relationship to Jesus do you know who he is do you know what he has done Do you know what he's capable of doing and he was exposing for that that group of people the the flaw in what they had believed you have not come to the place where you really believe that Jesus is who he is you have gotten part way but you haven't gotten all the way there and he exposes that during his discussion I want to turn that around though tonight and I want to show you legitimate lessons about legitimate relationships with the father uh, we could leave it as legitimate relationships with Jesus but Jesus intent is always to reconcile us to the father and so in this there are four legitimate lessons about legitimate relationships and it's in his argument that we find these and you'll recognize them as we go through and so on each of these four I'm gonna put three things up each of them ending with a question that is the practical application of this so let's look at the first one lesson number one uh, is back at, at verses 31 and 32 and I think we've read that several times so you understand it he does the if then he says if you continue in my word and that word continue is the idea of abide in my word if you abide in my word then are ye disciples indeed so here's lesson number one and he's looking at this group of people and he's saying you're not abiding in my word the idea of abiding is that you live in you immerse yourself in and you do it and so if we turn that around from a negative statement to a positive statement here's where I want you to turn the lesson around as we switch that around what we discover is that if you were a true disciple of Jesus Christ you would abide in his word so where it says that, that these people are going to be quickly convicted of not abiding in his word on the other side of the coin is the fact that if you are a true disciple you do continue in his word you do abide in his word and so a person who is a true disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be one who uh, holds his word out as a very high standard now this is not something that's new to you 
Uh, this is something that we kind of probably uh, drive into people because it is so important that the words of Scripture, the words of God, are the lifeblood of Christianity. We don't go outside of that. And as we look at his words, we come to the place where this was a test of true discipleship. And the test of true discipleship was very clearly, do you abide in his word? And so if we go to the third thing that we'll put up on each of th these three lessons, let's ask the question then, what is my relationship to the word? What is my relationship to God's uh, uh, word as it is expressed today in the scripture? Um, and for those of us who are true disciples, how do you answer that? Now, we're going to answer it a couple of different ways because uh, we're going to, number one, say, uh, do you heed it as it is preached? Whether you're in Sunday school class or in a service or wherever you might be that you hear his word taught or preached, how do you respond to that? When scripture is clearly put out before you, are you one who says, all right, I, my relationship to his word is that it guides my life. It makes the decisions for me. Um, if we move beyond that, uh, you're sitting in services, but what about your relationship to his word as far as reading it personally? Uh, if his disciples abide in his word, that really is the idea of live in his word. Uh, we're immersed in his word and his word is immersed in us. Uh, we kind of do an every other year thing, but it's probably worthy of more mention than I give it. I am very concerned that as a pastor, the sheep are feeding on the Word of God. You need good sermons, you need good fellowship, all of those things are, good, are important, but you need daily to feast on His Word. Are you reading the Scripture for yourself on a daily basis? And as you read the Scripture, are you uh, getting anything from it? Uh, the Holy Spirit promises to illuminate God's Word. Now there's a difference, if you're in the Sunday school class, we've been talking about does God reveal His Word anymore? No, He doesn't. What the Holy Spirit does is illuminate the word that he has given us. And so do you take the time in your relationship with the word to actually read it? Do you have something that you're doing that daily, regularly presents his word to you personally? It is compared to our food for daily living. What is your relationship to his word? If the Lord were to come to you today and say, you know, in verse 31, I want you to understand you are my disciple, you're a true disciple, if you abide in my word. Would you be a little fearful at that? Are you abiding in his word? Now again, I'm talking to the Sunday night crowd. And so these are people who are serious about their spiritual life. But are you taking the time to really know his word, ingest it spiritually, and then do it? What is your relationship to his word? This is an important statement. It's an important premise that he builds on. True disciples abide in the word. And as he looks at this group and says, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. His purpose in saying that was negative because he was going to show you are not abiding in the word, therefore you are not a true disciple. But we can also flip that around and say, if you are abiding in the word, you are a true disciple. And so God's word becomes essential in being a true disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. You cannot uh, take lightly his word, you can't abandon it, you can't just know about it, you need to know it and do it. All right, so there's lesson number one. Here's a second lesson that he gives us. When he's talking about this, in that same passage in the premise, he says, I want you to understand that you have to come to the place where you demonstrate freedom. Let's go again to verse 32. You shall know the truth, because you abide in his word, and that truth shall set you free, or it'll make you free. And of course, this is where he got into the discussion. They were somewhat offended by that in verse 33, where Abraham's seed, we've never been in bondage. How do you say that we'll be made free? And his answer was, you don't understand your homertiology, your sin. You don't understand the theology of sin. And so you think because you have this heritage that you are not in need of help. You've always come to church. You've always been a Christian. You've always been uh, a spiritual person. 
And so you don't need any help, and you don't realize you desperately need help. And that's where the Jews were. They desperately needed help. Do you, as a true disciple, though, demonstrate freedom? True disciples are free. And of course, as he goes down there, he says, we're free as sons. And, and this is another passage where interpretation is a little bit difficult because he says, the son shall set you free. Uh, the son sets you free. Is he talking about the fact that the son is the one who sets you free? Or is he just using that as an example? There are a couple of different ways to interpret that. But either way, a true disciple of Jesus Christ is free. He's one who has the freedom. And the freedom is as opposed to the bondage that you're in under sin. Do you have the freedom to live for the Lord? Can you live for him? Can you enjoy your freedom and really serve the Lord like you should? And so if we put the question up, what is my standing before God? Do I have the freedom of a son? Well, what's that look like? Well, again, you're not unfamiliar with the concept. Uh, you, a lot of you have children, and as, as having children, you know what your children are allowed to do, that either a servant in your household or a stranger is not allowed to do. Your children go look in your refrigerator and get things out. They get a bowl out and eat cereal at 11 o'clock at night. My kids still do that. They have the freedom to do that. Why? They're my children. My son. Uh, he's free to do things that other people would not be free to do. They know the, the code to the burglar alarm in my house. They can come in because they're related to me. And so there's a freedom that is allowed because they are uh, my children. And as Christians, there should be a freedom that we feel, a welcomeness into God's presence that other people are not going to have. A true disciple acts like he is a son. He has the perception of being a son. That, of course, will be built on as we go to the third lesson. And the third lesson says, you reflect your father's characteristics. Remember, as we looked at this this morning, he went to great lengths to come to verse 44. And verse 44 is the one that says, you are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father, you will do. That's the desires of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of it. But the whole passage has been a contrast between my father and your father. And as you go back to verse 37, or verse 38, he said, I speak that which I have seen with my father. And ye do that which ye have seen or heard with your father. And that's where the contrast starts. And in that, he, in the negative sense, is saying, my father tells me to do certain things and I do them. Your father tells you to do certain things and you do them. He's a murderer. You seek to kill me. He's a liar. You're going to be very deceptive in what you're going to do in the, next, in the coming days as far as trying to get the Lord Jesus Christ into this place where they can even crucify him. He said, you act like your father. And on the negative side, he was taking this group of people and saying, I can come to an absolute conclusion that you act like your father. And in verse 44 is the pinnacle of that. He's a murderer, you're a murderer. He's a liar, you're a liar. And these are the characteristics of your father. Now, if we switch that around, what should it look like? You reflect your father's characteristics. True disciples reflect the characteristics of God. We don't reflect the characteristics of fallen man. We don't reflect the characteristics of Satan. We reflect the characteristics of our heavenly father. That's what a true disciple does. This is the argument he was making. And again, on the negative side, he was looking at them and saying, you guys reflect the, the characteristics of the devil. You reflect the characteristics of your father, Satan. That's how I know where you are. But in the Christian realm, in true disciples, it certainly ought to be, and I'm thankful that I can look out and say it is, that most of the people that call themselves true disciples 
reflect the characteristics of their father, or at least try to reflect the characteristics of their father. Well, what are those characteristics? Well, they're innumerable, really. We have love. We have all those characteristics that are the characteristics of peace, that the characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit. We know that those are the things that people ought to see in us. There's even forgiveness, like our Father has forgiven, that would be characteristic of us because it's a characteristic of our Father. Well, if we contrast those things, we'll find that some things clearly fit on the side of God and some things clearly fit on the side of, of Satan or the demons. Take forgiveness as an example. When you look at forgiveness, if you're looking at it as a true disciple, somebody can do something very harsh to you, and yet you'll find the capacity to forgive them. You'll find the capacity to do that without bitterness, to even lose things that you shouldn't have lost, and count them as loss for him. And you'll move on and you'll keep serving the Lord and you won't get bitter and angry about it. You'll just keep serving the Lord because you have the characteristic of your father. What if you don't have that characteristic? Well, you get bitter and bent out of shape and you can never get back to a ministry because it's the characteristic of your father. And you have to get even with someone. Well, listen, you, a true disciple ought to reflect the characteristics of his father. We've been looking on Wednesday night at the passage in Peter that says, Be ye holy as I am holy. Well, what's the characteristic of the Father? Holiness. And so my uh, effort, my desire ought to be to reflect holiness because my Father is holy. If I'm not a, a, a true disciple, the characteristic will be unholiness that I reflect. And so the question then at the end of this particular lesson is, Whose parental characteristics do I reflect? We know that even within families that sometimes will say, he looks like his mother, or he looks like his father, or he acts like his mother, or acts like his father, or this person has the characteristics of his mother. We see that even within families. But in Christianity, we can see that there are some characteristics I should reflect. And if we look at it from the positive side, you and I, true disciples, should reflect the characteristics of our Heavenly Father. People ought to be able to see that in us. And I think many times they do. I've been greatly encouraged by the number of people who have said, I met someone from your church, and that person just really impressed me. And there are a lot of people that I've heard that about. But people have made uh, very gracious comments about our church family. And that's, uh, that is us reflecting the characteristics of our Father. And that's the positive side of this. As you're sitting there listening to Jesus' conversation, and on the negative side he's saying, you guys are obviously not believers because you reflect the characteristics of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father, you do. There are some who are listening and saying, hey, you know what, I don't reflect those. I do my best to reflect the characteristics of my father who is holy and loving and forgiving, and he's my father. I've been adopted into his family, and I want to reflect him. Now, sometimes we know we don't do a very good job at that, but whose parental characteristics do you reflect? The objective here was to use the argument and say, I know who you are because I see it in a negative way, but sometimes we can say, I know who you are because I see it in a positive way. Let's go on to the fourth one. The fourth lesson is the, the end result. And we, again, concluded with that this morning. You go through where they accuse him of being demon-possessed, and his argument is, look, a demon-possessed man does not honor God, and then God does not honor a demon-possessed man. And as he comes to his conclusion, then in verse 55, where he says, you know, I can't deny the fact that I know the Father, otherwise I would be a liar like you. And as he comes to that, then, then he mentions Abraham and how Abraham rejoiced and was glad. And the Jews were accusatory then. You're not yet 50 years old. And, and that's where he comes to his conclusion and says, before Abraham was, I am. You're going to have to come to a conclusion that I am God in human flesh. And they responded antagonistically to truth that he had taken great pains to prove. 
He had done miracles for two and a half years. He had proven his superiority over the spirit world, over the natural world. He had proven that he had the characteristics of God on hu in human flesh. And so now he was asking them, will you believe truth? And their response is antagonistic. They seek to stone him. Well, of course, the opposite of that would be true disciples respond positively. When you hear truth, how do you respond? This kind of makes the full circle because we were talking about truth to begin with. And as you read his word, how do you respond to his word? Well, here's the same thing on a positive side. You're sitting in a place where you are confronted with truth. How do you respond? And the disciples ought to respond positively. If we put it in the question form, it would look like this. How do I respond to truth? When I am reading the scripture, when I'm sitting in a Sunday school lesson or a, a service or an evangelistic meeting and truth is presented, how do I respond? And you have a couple of choices. You, know, you have the yes, no, maybe idea on all of that as well. Somebody can, can hear truth and say, no, I'm not going to give in to that. I'm not going to uh, be forgiving. I'm not going to be loving. I'm not going to be evangelistic. I'm just, I'm just not going to do it. And that would, of course, be the wrong. Somebody can say, yes, I'm going to do what God says. That's what we want. Then there are other people who say, you know, I'm not going to give God a yes or no. I'm just going to delay. I'm not really going to give an answer. Well, no answer or a delayed answer is really the same as saying no. When you're convinced that God's word says something and he wants you to do it, it is almost antagonistic to say, I'm going to delay, I'm going to put that off. God wants you to respond to truth when you hear it. And this is the positive lesson out of this. The negative lesson is that, that the uh, disciples who were not true disciples, the ones who professed belief but didn't back it up, they responded antagonistically. But you and I don't. You and I respond positively. And how do you respond to truth? When truth is presented to you, a true disciple is going to say, that's for me, I'm going to do that. I'm going to learn that, I'm going to implement that, I'm going to accomplish that, I'm going to make that part of my life because God wants me to do that. And obviously, we're trying to be positive tonight, but if you can, would look at God and say, no, I'm just not going to do it, that's not a true disciple. A true disciple is one who says, I'll do what God wants me to do. And so when you take this passage and you, you switch it, you, you turn it around and say, all right, I want to know what are the things that I heard the Lord Jesus Christ say that make a difference for me, the believer. Here are four lessons for a true disciple. Here are four lessons about uh, how to indicate or what indicates I'm a true disciple. I'm going to continue in his word. I'm going to live in freedom. I am free. I can, I, I can come into God's presence. I am the one who can uh, demonstrate the characteristics of my Father. I want people to see him in me. I don't want them to look at me and say, I'm not sure if he's a Christian or not. I want them to look at me and say, uh, he is of his Father. And his Father is the God of heaven. I want, to, I want to reflect that to people in my language, in my lifestyle. And I want to be one who responds positively, not antagonistically, to truth. I want people to see when God speaks, I'm going to respond. I'm going to do what he wants me to do. And the positive side of all this is I show and others can see that I'm a true disciple because of those things. Those th same things that he said to the Jews that would not respond correctly flipped around help us see what a true disciple looks like. And so there are four areas where you can look at and say, how am I doing? Four questions you can ask yourself. And the, the last one always brings it down where the rubber meets the road. How do I respond to truth? When it's presented, how do I respond to it? And even tonight, it may be that the Holy Spirit is working on you in some area. He's dealing with some area I may not even have mentioned. And you're thinking, God wants me to deal with that. How do you respond to truth? A true disciple responds positively, and I hope you'll do that. We're going to bow for prayer, and I trust as God deals with you that you will respond positively to him. Father, thank you for the time that you've given us. And Lord, I pray this evening that as we have looked at this passage a second time, that it would be something where 
this group that's here tonight can be encouraged. Lord, I thank you for the work that you've done. And as we've studied you in scripture, we recognize that you want us to reflect your characteristics. And I pray even this week that you'll give us the opportunity to do that. Whether it's at home, in our neighborhood, or at work, or out in uh, some other venue, I pray that you'll help people to see in us the love that you have demonstrated to us. And Lord, I pray that as we hear truth, that you'll help us to continue to respond in a way that will cause us to be more conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Lord, thank you for your kindness. And I pray that you'll help us to be faithful and effective for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Before you're dismissed tonight, if I have a couple of, of men, I think Jerry is out in the foyer. We need to move some computers from downstairs, upstairs to just the hallway out there. If we have a couple of folks that would be willing to help with that, uh, that would be great. Thank you. We'll see you on Wednesday night.